so much for joining us on other people's shoes as you know i am your host neil matthews thank you so much as i said for joining me today really excited about our guest today why you might ask yourself that i'm so excited because it finally took us to season 11 to get to the bayou country i don't know why it took us so long maybe because i've heard that there are alligators down there but i have heard that if you give them marshmallows the alligators leave or maybe they eat them maybe we're gonna have some crawfish maybe we're gonna have some gumbo i'm not really positive on this but hopefully our guest can tell us if we're doing things either the right way, the wrong way, and that we're not just doing nothing because we need to do something in order to do this. Help me welcome her in all the way from Louisiana. I thought I'd never say that. Esther, Esther, how are you today? (laughs) That was a fantastic introduction. (laughs) Yeah, so my mom grew up in Louisiana and she taught me how to make all the Louisiana gumbos and all that kind of thing. I actually grew up, she met my dad in Illinois when she went to college and I grew up in Illinois. And so that's why I don't have the Louisiana like slurring accent, but my daughter who is a RN does, and she's been travel nursing and they find it very hilarious back in Indiana. And she said, do you know they have a, they have a accent in Indiana? I'm like, yeah they do. (laughs) So the roles have been reversed. Because people tell me in Oregon, I have an accent and I'm trying to figure it out. I used to work for a company that it was a Fortune 500 company car dealership. And so I was calling all over the country. Right. And undoubtedly, I would get like Montana or I'd get Texas or I'd get, you know, wherever, North Carolina. Okay, never. But I I wanted it. (laughs) They would always tell me I have an accent. I don't hear it. But when I talk to my friends in Texas, I talk to my friends in Virginia or the South and I'm like, I can hear that. Right. Right. I don't hear it in me. I don't know. <laughs> but I don't hear it in you either. So there it is. Yeah, that's why we've lived here in Louisiana, Shreveport area since 2008. And so it, it, it's not, you know, close to the bayou necessarily, but we do have alligators. I mean, my friends have alligators showing up in their backyard. So that is a thing. Marshmallows. That's the first. Okay. My wife was in New Orleans, a girl's trip that we graduated from high school with. My wife and I are high school sweethearts, much like you and your husband. And so the girls took a trip to New Orleans. Sweet. Boys were not welcomed or invited, which I'm still mad about because I wanted to go for the Saints, the New Orleans Saints. And I was told that, no, sorry, boys are not welcomed on this trip. And I'm very, still not bitter. I'm I'm, I'm over it. I promise. <laughs> I'm totally, totally past it. <laughs> Not even talking about it anymore because I'm so over it. So back to you. So Esther, I'm so excited that you're here today. I'm so excited that we got to connect. Yes. I think there's just so much excitement here. So we got to get into it. So let's get going. So here it is. We love to ask this question as we lead off. What style of shoe do you like to wear? Okay. So I thought you're going to ask this and I had to look it up. I'm not sure exactly how to say it, but it's, I brought you an example and will be descriptive for your listeners. Is it called Esperil, Esperidils? Like it's the rope shoes that have like the rope <laughs> and usually it has like the ties so I brought one that has ties and here's ties like I love the ties but this doesn't have an aglet it actually has a fringe thing so yeah and I know that's where you're going with the aglet well not necessarily aglet but we can get to that sure that's what we're in we're in yeah. this season called aglets I've never had a guest like bring visual aids to help describe said shoes <laughs> So that's a first. That's good. I'm a teacher, so I always like to have visuals, and that's how I write, have stories, and, like, I want you to visualize yourself somewhere. So I'm hoping your listeners, so the shoes that, like, string all the way, like, partway up your leg, they're just, they're super cute, and I don't know, I just like the rope look. So that's what I'm into right now. I'm not going to wear those. Apparently, I have to wear (laughs) those, because we're in your shoes today. That's what we we try to metaphorically say, or I always get those two confused, metaphor or analogy, you know, maybe you could help in the teaching room. Yeah. with that yeah. you could set us straight on work. that okay they both so work. what 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 about the painted vans though you know those those painted vans the custom ones that you paint and then you put the your own design on them now those are cool they are cool i think i sent you a link we have a yes. past guest that was on that actually paints shoes and so fun times fun. but i'm yeah. a jordan guy i stick with the brand talk about brand things we were talking about your color scheme that you're into red because it's a brand color right? which is okay it's fine 
It, it really is. For me, like the brand, if I was going to get behind, it would be the Carolina color, of course, with the Jordan brand. So there we are. Got to stay on brand <laughs> as we as we so often say. But Esther, I'm curious about this for you. Because again, this aglet, this plastic thing at the end of our shoe, this metal thing in some shoes. By the way, I just got some shoes recently that had metal aglets. So I was really excited about that. Because yes. like, that thing is never going to come off unless I right. cut it. What is that aglet? What is that thing that that if you didn't have in your life that wasn't in place, probably unravel and you really wouldn't be the person maybe that you were designed to be. Right. Well, you know, when we first started talking about this messaging back and forth about the show, I first gave you like several things, but I wrote down care. So there's two things really, care and character because I can't care any more than someone else, right? Or I have to care more than the other person. And I think we expect people to care. Society tells you that, you know, you're owed something, that you your doctor owes you this, your counselor owes you this, your parents owe you this. And sometimes we get the feeling like, oh, well, my problems are due to somebody else. But when it boils all the way down in the pot, it depends on, do I care about me? Do I care where I'm going? Do I care if I let myself go? Like it has to be all up to me. If I really care about me or not to take someone else's advice, to take the consideration of someone else, do I really care? And maybe that's wrapped up in character. So when you hear character and when you hear about carry as as you're saying how does that relate to you and how does that kind of become your dna or come who you are and come part of your essence so I am a I'm a faith believer. So, you know, I do attribute a lot of it to my faith. Outside of that, I would say that my character is something that I fall back on because for a really long time, it was my sister and I growing up together with a single parent. And so for a really long time, I was the quiet one. I was the one that didn't talk. She did all the talking, although she was younger than I was. And I just thought that I was more shy and reserved. I thought of myself as sweet little Esther. When I really did have a lot of opinions, I really did have a lot of things to say. I characterized myself as more negative. I characterized myself as being careful. I didn't think I was optimistic. And so to fall back on what you think is a character trait might be something that is a crutch or something that you just a trap that you fall into stay in a mode of what everybody else expects of you. Falling into character for me was something that I had to fall back on well, like I could be a cheater. I really could make a lot of money cheating people, but my character has kept me, it's been the aglet to keep me from, from cheating people. Character has kept me from gossiping behind other people's backs when it could have maybe raised me to a higher level right on the surface. But my character and caring about who I was has kept me from doing some things that maybe would have been a trap for me. And in the end, I would have unraveled. I think, again, going into your character and going into caring for people and thinking that over and even hearing that as you're saying that, has there ever been a danger for you in being that people pleaser that, well, I just have to perform. I just have to, even when I don't feel like it, I have to care. You know, I I don't like that person, but I'm going to fake caring for them. Talk about being maybe a thief. I think there's some deceptiveness in that. Maybe I'm misreading the room. I don't know. But, you know, again, when I hear things like that, I think there, there's got to be a root issue there. And maybe maybe you can help us dig that out. Oh, my husband and I, I'll just tell kind of a backstory. We were we married out of high school, went to college, Bible school, and then went out to the pastorate. And for 16 years, we pastored. And so my care was all about like pouring into the people. And so I remember one church that we went to, like all the women in the church were like businesswomen. They always wore like these suit coats and everything. Everything. And a lot of the women were had weight issues. They would dress like oversized. And I thought, well, to be liked, I need to wear suit coats. I need to wear oversized clothes. You know, I don't want to make anybody feel bad. So I, I don't want to, you know, like dress in a way that would make them feel bad. And so my care really put me on the back burner. You know, trying to care for other people over your own needs, that ends up wearing you down a lot. You can't care anymore. You can't care because you don't have enough care to give out when you don't care for yourself. And so I had to figure out after going down a long spiral, learning a lot about myself, I had to determine that, you know, you need to care about yourself first and then you care about others. Giving more of yourself than you should will end 
up tearing you down in the end and it will unravel you. And so I had to learn the hard way to be true to myself and to be open. And so now I don't hesitate. I say it right off the bat. And that's really who I am underneath. And it's shockingly so because I have gone from this sweet little Esther that I grew up to be to be just open. And just frank and honest, and I'm coming to find out, Neil, that people really do appreciate when you're open and honest with them, when you're not like beating around the bush. It comes out 10 years later that, oh, she really didn't like steak after all. She was just being polite and eating steak. You know, <laughs> in the end, I feel like it's better just to tell people right off the bat, hey, I prefer tea over coffee. Give them that preference. Hey, you want to meet? Okay, sure. I can't stand whatever food, but I love Asian food. I love seafood. And to be open and honest with people, I find that they, they appreciate that more about my character. And then I'm caring about myself as well and them. So has there ever been a moment where you didn't care about yourself? Ever been a moment where I didn't care about myself? And maybe somebody had to come along and remind you, hey, Esther, seems like you don't care right now. I hate to admit this. I am pretty much type A personality and I've I've always really cared about myself, not in a selfish way, but I've had to put people like caring for others, you know, that had to be my focus to do that. Um but there's been a time where I'm like I don't care. You know, my give a care is broken <laughs> and I don't care anymore. And that puts me in a dangerous spot, really, because I've found as an adult, especially like when my give a care is broken, I don't check my calendar for the next day. And then I miss a really important doctor's appointment that I've had scheduled for two months. When my give a care is broken, then I don't pay that bill that's scheduled because today I don't give a care. My give a care is broken <laughs> and I'm just checking out. And that has really hurt me. That's really damaged me when I let myself go. And I feel like that's starting to unravel, let myself go. And then I, I don't check up on that person that I'm supposed to check up on. And then I, that's when I do start to unravel. And I hate that feeling. Well, I think that's also the danger as a pastor's wife, as you mentioned. Right. I mean, every pastor's wife I've ever met has felt like they have to look a certain way. They have to dress a certain yes. way. They have to go back to our kind of silliness of our accents. We have to talk a certain way. We have to care a certain way. We have to care for everyone. We should love everyone no matter what. What's the danger in that for you, though? Well, the danger in that was for me, and now we are not in the pastorate anymore. During that period of time, the danger was, you know, you have these women that get up, you know, at six o'clock in the morning. And so, of course, they're driving past the church. And I, this is an example, driving past the church and they're like, oh, I didn't see any lights on. So I didn't think you were up. Well, of course, <laughs> you know, the next time I thought, oh, I got to leave a light on because I need them to think I'm getting up at 630 in the morning, which I wasn't. I had three small children. You know, that's deception. A, that's a character issue. And then you have these people that are staying up to 11 o'clock, you know, saying that they're refinishing their floors or whatever, you know, they stay up till everything's done. Well, obviously, then I had to have the light on at 11 o'clock at night because both ends of the candle, you know, had to be going, you know, just to make that impression that I'm all this. And, and I really am. And I did get a lot done because of that, because I was doing all the things. But I tell my friend and, I, and to this day, I'm, I'm the pastor's wife friend. I take her food. I dote on her. I do do a lot of things for my pastor's wife now because I realize that box, that glass box that really you shouldn't put yourself in. I realize that. And I don't have high expectations for them because I realize you can't please everyone and please yourself. Like you've got to please God and yourself. And basically that's it. Because if you try to please everybody, you'll please no one. And then do you end up doing nothing? Well, some people do nothing. I know that's what my book is about, but it's about no dot. Thing. Because as I talk about my books, we try to take on titles, we try to take on accolades, we try to take on all these things to appear to be successful when it's really no thing. No thing can make me look better. No thing can make me feel more worthy. No thing can make me more important. Really, it's who I am created to be and building up my character. I don't need the latest trends. I don't need the latest fashion to make me into who I am. And I think a lot of times people try to take on all these different things and it really weights us down and when we can release it and let go of all the things and just be ourselves who God has made us to be then we can truly be free well I mean let's be honest there's that person listening right now I'm sure there has to be yeah that is saying well yeah like Esther come on you you don't know me I I can't I can't just right be that nothing like Linus that blanket needs to define me <laughs> Like Charlie Brown, Snoopy needs to help me. My Jordans need to define me. If I don't have this career, it needs to define who I am. So this is counterintuitive to what I've always been taught. What would you speak to that person about? Well, I would speak to them and I would say, you know, 
what is waiting you down in your life? Some things you think you really need, but is it waiting you down? Let's talk about expectations. Let's talk about experience. Some people never do succeed because they think, oh, I don't have the experience. After all, I can't podcast. I don't have the experience, right? Neil, that could have been your excuse. I don't have the finances. I don't have the experience. I don't have the education. I don't have the confidence. And a lot of people are perfectionists. They think they have have to have all these things in place before they can step out and do something. And it's like, wait a minute, I would have never written a book either if I would have thought I had to have the perfect whatever. I didn't. And basically during the pandemic, God said, this is your time. I want you to take that journal that you've been writing on and I want you to turn it into a book. And so if I would have said, well, I don't know enough. I don't know the right people. I don't, you know, then I would have never done it. I feel like sometimes things, if people will really take an introspection and take a look at it, they'll find that things are bogging them down more than helping them. When I think going back to your original statement of you got to get to that point of not caring. You just got to yeah. get to the point of saying, okay, I don't have it all figured out yet. Yes. I'm going to set that aside. I'm not going to care necessarily about that anymore. I'm going to focus on what I am able to do. Right. I feel like we have limiting beliefs. We have limiting beliefs in business. We have li- limiting beliefs in our personal lives. We have limiting beliefs in our internal, in our mindsets. And a lot of times things can hold us back because of our limiting beliefs. And I just believe that nothing is impossible with God. I mean, literally means that, you know, he's incapable of doing nothing. And so the the sky is the limit for us as well. And I just don't believe that we should have those limiting beliefs. And even though if we mess up, even if we fall flat on our face, just fall forward and keep on going. But there's something that never trying. And then you don't know if you could have done something or not. And then you you limit yourself of making a mistake and knowing, well, that didn't work. So, <laughs> you know, you gain experience, you gain knowledge and you try something else. It's like, okay, but that does work for me. So I'm always curious as authors, the, the creative process of it all, the the nights, the early mornings, maybe it's the the mid-afternoon coffee shop. You, you pull over to the side of the road, you quickly journal down maybe that thought so you don't lose it because it was so profound and so good. Right. But maybe there was a moment as you're writing this that you're like, man, this chapter is so challenging or this section is so raw, so real. And you're like, I don't want to include this, but you feel this nudge, this urge. Maybe it's God, you know, maybe it's your own inner self saying this is a must. This must be in there. But as you're writing it, Again, as you're maybe handwriting it or even typing it out, was there was there a section for you that you're like, oh, this was really hard to write? There really was a section that was super hard for me to write because if I could tell just part of the backstory, I didn't intend to write a book. I started as a journal and for two years, this word nothing kept coming to my mind. I would be studying and reading in the Bible and, you know, God created the world from nothing and then he hung it on nothing and we'd be singing a song and Lauren Daigle would have the song and we had the word nothing in it and Elevation Worship has a song. There's just all these songs with nothing and then I'd be going down the road and see it on a billboard and so this word kept popping up. So I basically did a word study in my journal and I would just write it down and write my thoughts down. My friends would be talking to me and I'd say, hey, do you mind if I send you something for my journal? journal. So I would get their email address and email it to them. And they said, that really helped me, Esther. And one day we were sitting around the living room and my husband, we had company over for dinner. And then we sat in the living room drinking coffee. And he said, Hey, Esther, read them something from your book. And I could have kicked them, but we were sitting in the living room and I couldn't (laughs) because he said the word book. And that's kind of what the seed was sown that this is going to be a book someday. And then during the pandemic is when God spoke to me and he said, right now is the time to write your book. And I could have pushed back on that. And so you were asking about, has there ever been a time? Yeah, I could have pushed back on that and said, well, I'm not an author. Well, I've never written a book before. Well, I don't have a publisher, but I didn't let those excuses. I just wrote the book because God's like, write the book. So I wrote the book. So while I was writing it, I did, I bumped up on that and I bumped up on the identity, the, the portion of identity, because the book is in four sections, reality, security, identity, and maturity. And you know, how many of us know when the rug is drug out from under us, Neil, in our job, in our career, in our personal lives, like when the rug is drug out from us, it affects our security. And then not only does it affect our security by our, our identity, like, well, who am I? What am I supposed to be doing? And so when I bumped up against that topic of identity, it was the part in the book that talks about Jesus Christ himself became nothing. He humbled himself and became nothing. And I thought, okay, I don't want to tell people that. You know, that we actually have to humble ourselves and become nothing before we can become something. And Neil, I feel like in all of our lives, when we realize 
you know, I really am nothing. But with God's help, I can do incredible things and I can be something. And I feel like when we hit rock bottom, whatever that might be in our lives, it might be in our career. It might be that we're jerked out of ministry. And it's like, oh, well, who am I now? Right? I'm not the pastor's wife that's meeting all the needs of all the people. Who am I? I don't have people. I don't have all the jobs to do that I used to have. So who who are my people now? Who am I as a person now? You know, I've got to care about myself. And so when you hit rock bottom, I feel like that's when we can rise to the top and say, okay, here's where my identity. So yeah, I did I did bu- a bump up against that whole topic of identity and who we are in Christ. Eve as a woman, she had nothing on. That's how God created her. And I didn't want to talk about this in the book because I didn't want to be offensive and it's not offensive in the book, but you know, they were created perfect. She was a perfect woman, yet Satan convinced her that she was lacking something. And so what did she do? She tried to take on things to cover up. And I feel like we do the same thing in this life. We take on things. But Satan convinced her that she wasn't, that God was deceiving her and that she needed to take on something else. So what do you say to that woman? Because let's face it, you seem like a woman minister in some respects. I'd say preach it, sister. It might offend some because they're like, oh, women can't be <laughs> pastors. They can't bring God's word. Stop for a second. And just think for a second. Think about this. But if you were again, coffee shop, woman comes in, tears in her eyes, struggling, searching for that purpose, that care, you know, it feels like nobody cares enough about me, you know, kind of a, that woe me, your mentality. Yes. I'm sure you've never been there, right? Never, ever. Never, never, never. Because I think we all have. <laughs> well, I do talk about, and talking about women. So I did have the word girl in my book. And my first editor was a guy, he's in his mid thirties. His name was Holland. And he's like, this is just for women. Could have fooled me. So I took out everything that had to do with the, like the female gender. My CPA was the first guy that bought my book was my CPA. He pre-ordered it. My cover has a coffee cup, a red coffee cup on it. After going through all these designs, I wanted cute, you know, designs for a woman's Bible study. God wouldn't let me. And so like it's co-ed Bible studies now. It's a craziest thing that God knows he is doing. So it's it's multi-gender, but I would tell that woman, I would tell that man that you know, Joseph, the story of Joseph, he's given the coat of many colors and he was sold into slavery. And it's a Bible story that all of us know whether we're religious or not. And we know that story, how the coat was given to Joseph by his father and his brothers were so jealous of him. His coat was stripped off him. You know, he was sent to Egypt and his plans looked nothing like he thought they would. Yet the promises of God were sure. And the dreams of God that he had given to Joseph, they were sure. And they did come true years and years and years later. But I would tell that person that that as Joseph's brothers, remember his brothers were so jealous, but they ended up years later coming back to Egypt. And this is a whole story for another time when I go speak to groups, but I tell them that, you know, you will either live the dream that God has given to you, or you will live in the shadow of someone else's dream. Because Joseph's brothers also lived that dream out, the realities of that dream, but they were living in the shadow of the promise that Joseph had been given, that dream that Joseph, so Joseph lived the dream. And so even though his reality, the rug was dry, out from underneath him more than once. Because listen, Neil, remember the coat wasn't just jerked off him once, but twice. Because when he was in Egypt, do you remember he worked he worked his way up in Potiphar's house and all that? And then he was thrown into prison because Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him and she ended up with his coat. But this time it was personal. It wasn't just a job that's been taken away from you once, the code that's been taken away from you twice. And I think that's what in many times in our life, when we have a situation where it's the second marriage, the second job that's been taken away from you. And when you earn it, like it could have gotten really personal for Joseph. So I'd tell that man, I'd tell that woman, what Joseph told the butler and the baker while he's sitting there in prison. He said, remember me, for I have done nothing to deserve this. So he realized his reality. Hey, You know, I've done nothing to deserve this, but I'm going to keep trying again because there's a promise. I know there's a better day coming and I'm going to not come unraveled. I'm going to keep it together and I'm going to make it. And he had the confidence that, you know, his character, that's what he didn't sacrifice. Coming back to that whole thing of caring and character, Joseph didn't sacrifice his character for the coat. You know, he could have gone along with her wishes, right? And kept his second coat. He could have, but he would have lost his character. And to me, keeping our character and keeping ourselves intact, that's what it's all about. And so I tell that person, stay true to yourself, care about yourself because there is a promise and God's got you. I think it was the cupbearer that reminded Pharaoh of Joseph too, by the way. Right. Was it two years later or something? Something like that. Some time had passed, but I I just think it's kind of maybe ironic or maybe you intended this. I don't know, but it's the cupbearer pouring himself out before Pharaoh going, oh, whoa, I'm in (laughs) 
a mistake, Mr. Farrell. Uh, so there's this guy down in the prison that can interpret dreams. Right. Kind of ironic in some respects that the cupbearer being poured out into nothingness. And he, you know, he went to Egypt. He couldn't speak the language. It was a big pain for me when my plans go sideways. I hate for my plans to go sideways. But when our plans go sideways, the promises of God are still strong and they're relevant. So even if it doesn't look like the the way I thought it should or would, God's promises are still real to me. And just having the character in spite of it, it will come to pass. So Esther, being a mom, I'm guessing you've you've probably walked through a lot of mom stuff. I have. Boy mom, girl mom. You kind of have both, right? If I'm not mistaken, you have... You've been blessed in that respect. You're not. You're not other one. You're a hybrid, right? I'm a hybrid. <laughs> what can I say? So in that, I'm just wondering, like, as your kids walk through this journey with you, not only of the book, but just your mm-hmm. life, and you know, watching you and your husband and your marriage and all this stuff that they've been observing. Which, by the way, an old pastor used to say to me, "More is caught than taught." Right. Still struggle with. <laughs> What is one thing that you hoped your kids really do catch from you and your husband and really what you're about? Let's talk about what I hope they didn't catch (laughs) because God has dealt with me about this. You know, they don't have to be like me. God talked to me when I was a 12 year old girl, since my dad walked out on us when I was eight years old. And so I was basically reared by a single parent. I had a really strong relationship with God and I would talk to him like he's my dad. You know, I would look at the clouds and just say, okay, dad, so what do I do now? Okay, dad. And I thought it was cool because I mean, after all, God was my dad. Why would I need an earthly dad? So I didn't feel sorry for myself whatsoever. I had to realize that my kids growing up, my son's married now, my two older daughters, you know, they're traveling nurses. One's graduating next week as a nurse practitioner. And then I still have a 16 year old at home. So I really am in between all the ages. But one thing that I had to realize was not going to happen was that they were not going to have a relationship with their spouse like I have with mine. They were not going to have a relationship with God like me. They were not going to have a relationship with their coworkers like me because their personalities are different and that I had to trust that they were going to have the character, hopefully, that they would mold their character and not just their personality or my personality, my rules. That's what I hope will rub off on them, that they would have the love of themselves like I've had, the love of others, and the care in a healthy way. You know, care in a healthy way where you are balancing it all out because I feel like if we care too much about ourselves, we're off balance. If we care about others too much, then we're off balance. We'll become unraveled. So I really hope that they would pick up those character traits of really blooming in where their character is strong. You know, my oldest is very strong in her intuitiveness. She's very intuitive, which is really helpful as a nurse, right? And she's dealt with COVID patients. She worked with COVID floor for that whole pandemic year. And she's pretty intuitive into people's needs. And so she saved lives when some doctors have overlooked it because she's been that really intuitive nurse. So what I hoped my kids would glean from, from our lives was to lean into their strengths and then lean into their weaknesses because their weaknesses might be different than mine, but to lean into their weaknesses, to improve their weaknesses, because a lot of times we'll lean into our strengths, neglect our weaknesses when we should be leaning into our weaknesses just as much as our strengths. I love what you're saying because I think so many times as parents, we want to project on them what we want for them. If I'm hearing you say, that's what I'm hearing you say in that. Yes. Is you want them to have your faith. You want them to look at your marriage and want your marriage. You want them to look at your relationships with others and want that relationship too. Yes. Right? Right. And what you're saying is, if I'm hearing, again, if I'm hearing you right, is you're saying you want them to kind of see it, recognize it, but also go find it on their own. Right. And own it. And own it. Just like my son, for instance, you know, I'm, you know, mother-in-law for the first time in my life. So I'm treading very carefully and trying to get wisdom. My son didn't marry the person that I thought he would marry, like the personality type, the whole, like you can't have a personality type for your kids. You've got to let them marry who God leads along their pathway. And and you can't project upon them your modes and methods because they might be better than you are (laughs) in some aspect. They might be a better money manager than you are. They might be a better housekeeper than you are. I mean, so to project my thought patterns on them would just be would be awful. And so I did have to learn that very early on as a mother to let them 
blossom and bloom how how they are to blossom and bloom. Yeah, no, I I I've never thought about it from that standpoint before because again, I've always been taught, you know, Paul talks about this in the Bible, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. First right. off, that's a bold statement. Let's just be clear on that. Bad pastors say too, you know, in my life who said, "Look at my life, imitate it. Look how great it is. Look, you know, look at how I love my wife, look at how I treat my kids, look at how, you know, whatever." And it's like, "Well, wait a second. Why do I want your life? Don't I want my life?" Respond and then I want to lead into another question. Well, and that's what I've always told my kids, you know, as they've grown up, I'm saying, Hey, if there's something that you see in me, tell me. And really they, they have been honest <laughs> because I want them to see my flaws and I want them. And I've told them, I'm like, you're going to be such a better mo- mother than I have been because you've learned from me and you're going to hone your own skills. And my daughter, my 16 year old just told me that yesterday. She's like, yeah. And she said, and, and mom, you know, not to be ugly or mean, but like I plan to be better. And I'm like, that's it. Thank you. You have the, you've gleaned that from me. And, and I'm, I'm rejoicing. Actually, I'm, I'm rejoicing that, you know, they are looking at my flaws and saying, Hey, how can I, how can I be better than that? And I've told them, look, in these areas, I'm a better mom than my mom was because I learned from her and you're going to be a better mom. Like I planted that seed all along and you're going to be a better parent than I have been because you're going to have learned from me. And so I, I've successfully, God helping me, you know, I planted that seed. <laughs> so awesome to think about that. So I came across this statement. I'm curious what you think. It says, if you want to live, stop asking for a permission slip. Do it now and regret it Wow. Later. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think it was Christine Kane that said something about, you know, no ship has sailed, you know, out of the harbor past something, you know, you can't be turned around or there's a, there's a state and I just can't remember it. But I always tell myself that, well, I'm going to do the best that I can. And then if it's not good enough, the next time I'll, I'll do it better. But I've found that forgiveness is almost easier than permission. (laughs) You know, if you mess up, it's like, okay, I I messed up. And that's kind of been my motto all along. And, you know, maybe people would disagree with me, but forgiveness is easier than permission because there's sometimes where you have a split second to make a choice and you make it the best of your ability. And you might have lost out if you didn't make that split decision. You know, yeah, it could be a terrible decision. You know, my daughter's driving now. She's 16. And I've told her, I'm like, once you look both ways, you know, and the way is clear and you feel like those cars, I said, don't second guess yourself, pull out and don't say, cause she was like pulling out and like creeping out and then, oh wow, wow, the car's right there. I'm like, no, you've got to make that decision and then pull out. And I feel like in life, a lot of times, Neil, we can pray, we can ask God, you know, deliberate, you know, should we do this? Should we not? You know, and you deliberate for two weeks and then, you know, crypto prices are up and you didn't get in at the bottom when you should have. <laughs> um, I'm just being silly. You know, sometimes we do deliberate and God's like, just make a decision. And, you know, I've given you the brains, I've given you the wisdom and some, you know, some bad decisions are bad decisions. There's very little things that you can really undo. And I mean, you know, or not learn from. I think of so many times and I I can think of a couple ladies and even some guys that are so afraid to make a decision that they just don't make the decision. And in not making the decision, they're making a decision. If you followed me on all the decisions. Yes. What is the danger of that for you if you had been that in that mindset of saying, you know what, too scared about maybe it's writing. Maybe it's about being that perfect pastor's wife. Maybe it's being the best mom ever. Maybe it's being the best wife ever. Yeah. But if you had stayed in that indecisiveness and said, well, I don't want to offend, I don't, uh, uh," you know, and you kind of have this back and forth battle and you did nothing to quote your book. Right. What's the danger in that for you if you just stayed there? Well, so I talked about, you know, we started this podcast about being, you know, the little sweet little Esther and I really, I still am sweet. Okay. (laughs) I may tell you right ahead. Boom. You know, I hate that. I, I still am kind and caring. I came to this point in my life as a young adult through pastoring and through experiences that fear could no longer hold me. And I know a lot of people talk about fear and, but I really was fearful. I was fearful of the new. I was fearful of the old. I was fearful of staying where I was. I was fearful and walking ahead. I was fearful fearful of diving, taking the deep dive. I was fearful of, I was fearful of everything. And so God really dealt with me and said, you know, that's not just being careful, that's being fearful. And so I ask people when I go and speak, I ask them, what thing is holding you back? You know, is it fear? Is it prejudice? Because a lot of times our prejudices will hold us back. You know, I had to determine that things would not hold me back, that I would, I would go for it. And I ended up asking myself, what is in your hand right now? 
you know, a bird in hand is better than two in the bush. So what is in my hand right now? My neighbor, I remember praying for her and thinking, how can I minister to her? And how can I talk to her? She lives an alternate lifestyle. You know, we have nothing in common, but yet she needed a friend. I felt like God spoke to me one day and said, take her a pie, take her a chocolate pie. And I'm like, I roll. Okay. Does she like chocolate? Okay. Does she like pie? What if she's not home when I take it to her? You know, all the excuses. What was in my hand? That was what was in my hand. That was in my house right now to do. And I think we feel like, you know, when a better day, when a, you know, better temperature, better season, better whatever, then I'll do this thing. And we can make up all kinds of excuses when I ask myself, what's in my hand? That might be literally, you know, God asked Moses, you know, what's in your hand? He had a stick. He went and led the children of Israel out because he did what he could with what was in his hand. And that was a stick. You know, we know what all, if we're a Bible follower, we know what all that represents, but what's in your hand, what's in your house, and then what's in your heart? So that's kind of been the three questions that I ask myself and I ask people, well, what's in your heart to do? You know, well, what's in your hand? It may be something like, you know, the lady in the Old Testament that she said, I have nothing but this pot of oil. And the prophet told her to go out and collect jars and she kept pouring and pouring and pouring. And it ended up, you know, having oil for the entire community and for herself to pay off her debt. But sometimes we think, oh, this is nothing. But I ask people, well, what's that in your hand? You know, I had a keyboard. I had a pen. That's what I had in my hand. And what was in my heart? I had words to share with my friends. I had words to share from my journal with my friends. So what's in your heart? What's in your hand? And what's in your house? That might be your wheelhouse. You know, you, it might be in your wheelhouse to do a podcast. It might be in your wheelhouse to make a pie. But what's in your house? It might be what's in your house, literally. I love that so much. I love that idea of what's in your hand. Yeah. That, is, that was powerful. That was good stuff. So I know you're not a sports fan. I know this. You know that. I know this. I, we put the research department on it. They verified. <laughs> You've never even been to Baton Rouge. I've heard. Also, you don't really care about the LSU <laughs> Tigers, which I think is phenomenal that you live in Louisiana and don't care about the Tigers. People are going to egg your house now. Okay, hope not. That's not a prophecy. I do, I do watch but, it with my husband. So here's my question. Do you know how many people can get into that stadium to cheer on those beloved LSU Tigers that everyone else loves? I have no you? idea. Like 50,000? How about 102,321 people? What? All cheering on LSU, LSU. Crazy. Tigers. Yeah. So there you go. So Brian Kelly and his LSU Tigers this year as they, uh, you know, as they start their football season. But I say that a little bit to be funny, but a little bit to be kind of serious in this moment. They actually call it also Death Valley, by the way. I don't know why. I, I'm not an LSU fan. So somebody from LSU will have to write in and tell me why they call it <laughs> Death Valley also. But I want to use that name for a second because think about this again. If we put you on that 50-yard line with the tiger in the middle, because I think there's a tiger kind of eye in the middle, if I remember right, 102,321 people. We get the lights. We get a little stage for you, maybe some red steps to, so you feel more comfortable, maybe a red carpet even again so you feel right com you know, comfortable with your red and you got your red coffee cup. If I gave you this microphone and I said, Esther, here's your moment, much like Esther from the Bible. Speak to your people. Now, I, I think your people, if I was going to project your avatar, your people are these people that are hurting, yeah, that are searching, that are perfectionists, that have been struggling their whole life with feeling like nobody cares about me. I'm caring for all these people, but nobody cares about me. Why doesn't anybody care about me? Me, 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 me. What would you say to them in that moment in LSU Stadium, Death Valley? Now, I know you don't have to have a LSU sweater on if you don't want one. We could get you something else. But <laughs> But what do you say in that moment to them? I would ask them one question. I would first begin it with a statement. And I would say, this is your life. What are you going to do with it? And that was a question that God asked me when we, 16 years in the ministry, our daughter had a brain tumor and it spiraled us financially and just a lot of things that happened. And that's why we ended up here in Louisiana from Texas. I remember feeling so frustrated. Everything was different. I was not, like I said, all these things. I remember throwing a throw pillow on the couch and that's exactly what God asked me. He's like, this is your life, Esther. What are you going to do with it? I bowed up. I'm like, God, what do you mean? You're the one that caused, all like, you could have changed all this. You know, you could have reorganized, reordered my whole life. But, but really, he was so kind to me because it's really my life. And what am I going to do about it? And what am I going to do to hone in on my habits? And so that's what I would ask the people. This is your life. Do you care? 
Do you care enough to do something about it? You know, there's all kinds of people that can help us. There's counselors, there's, you know, medications. We look for all kinds of things to help us. But unless we put into practice these podcasts, you know, I listen to podcasts for my mental health. I learn a lot of things from podcasts. And that's part of my health regimen. My care regimen is listening to podcasts. I have to care. I have to care about me. And so I would ask that person, this is your life. What are you doing with it? I think that's so profound because again, I think so many times I know I want it. Yeah. I want that quick fix. I want that Burger King. I want it my way. I want it right now. I want Amazon <laughs> in two days. You know, Jeff Bezos, it's not two right. days. Word of the wise. Stop going in space and fix Prime. Okay. It's not two days anymore. It's three. I want that all right now. We do. I talk about in my book is facing reality. I had to face my reality. I couldn't live in the past. Well, if I was in this house, if I was here, if I was, no, I'm here. And so right now I'm here. And I talk about that, you know, story about, you know, people that are taken as prisoners of war and they have to come to grips with their reality, come to grips with, I've been going through a horrible divorce. I've been going through a miscarriage. I've been been going through a job loss, you know, come to grips with your reality. Don't negate it. You know, it is something. Don't negate that horrible experience it. Experience it, your reality, and come to grips with, okay, this is where I am, but where am I going from here? And so I would tell that person, okay, yeah, don't try to brush it under the rug. We all know that doesn't work, Neil. That doesn't work. And don't say it's nothing. Um, it is something. Deal with it and say, okay, this is where I am, but where am I heading? with this? And where is my life going to go? Where do I see myself five years from now? Where do I see myself 10 years from now? Where do I see my kids a year from now? Where do I see them five years from now? And that gives us hope that there is a future. And this is the thing, we're going to be taking steps, right? I mean, there's going to be tomorrow. So I can either get in my bed and cover up the covers, or I can say, okay, I'm going to sleep another hour. And then after that hour, I'm going to get up and I'm going to face today. And I'm going to face today with courage because if I don't, I'm going to face today and the sun's going to come up, the sun's going to go down. But you know, whether I stay in bed or get out of that bed, it's going to be two different things. I can get out of that bed and go for a walk and try to reframe my mindset and get my mind in a different space. So Esther, speaking of said book, where can folks go to get that right now if they want? They can go on Amazon and order it from Amazon. It's no dot thing. The dot stands for the pauses in lives. While God's doing a thing, the nose and seems like waits all the way along. God's doing a thing. So no dot thing. It's under my name, Esther Panabaker on Amazon. And then estherpanabaker.com is my website. They can order it through my publisher there as well. You know, Esther, I know you said at the onset pre-show in the green room that you are a little older than I am. I am. I'm 50. I, I just turned 50 in November. All right. I was going to say you didn't have to say it, but you know, there you are. All right. I don't care. So, you know, being that you are so much older than I am, you probably <laughs> forgot one place where folks can go to get it also. It's okay, though. I mean, being 50, you probably forgot. It's fine. <laughs> Let me just punch you through the screen. They can also get it at OPSpodcast.com slash books that I love. It'll be up towards the top. Not the tippy top. Not the tippy top. Everybody okay. wants the tippy top, but it'll be up towards the top. Can't miss it. Red cup, as I mentioned. Thanks. Uh, very good cover, even though it is red. You could have gotten a light blue cup. Well, could have, but see, the cover is a little bit of a light blue. Oh, and, it is. I do see the, that. Yeah. yeah the, and so I had a millennial actually design my cover. Yeah, those darn millennials. I know. They're fantastic. They can be pretty good. Called Senseless, and it's these five questions about our senses and then the six is a wild card yikes and you don't worry you don't have to answer all five or all six in this case but we are going to roll on your behalf i know you don't care but i did hear because you told me again in our pre-show stuff that your pastor your current pastor the guy that you're you're listening to every sunday now was a quarterback at the university of north carolina right yes well, he played in their app for their football, and he, he actually preaches messages. He preaches in jeans a There's lot. There's nothing wrong with jeans <laughs> and, and a hoodie, by the way. Because he's saying. a coach. Yeah, but he's a coach, and he actually gives us, like, life skills for life. And he preached, like, on football, like, how that relates to – it's fantastic. So that's why I had to start watching football, to be honest, <laughs> so I can understand the messages. To follow his analogies. That's fun. Does he ever wear a Carolina hoodie when he's preaching? Yes. Okay. I need to meet this guy just to shake his hand and say thank you, sir. He sent us this cup because he knew you were coming on today. Fantastic. He sent you a North Carolina cup because he's like, hey, Esther's coming on. We've got to get her on brand meal. I'm like, all right, we're doing it. So this is from him. I'm just kidding. It's my cup. So here we go. I'm going to roll on your behalf because you're still in Louisiana. All right. You got this wonderful number four. Woo! 
There it is. It's backwards, but there we are. All right. So as a mom, this might resonate with you. I don't know. We'll find out. Here we are. So question number four is this. When you hear this sound, it always makes you smile. Oh, my goodness. Hmm. Probably, it's going to sound crazy, but the snow cone machine, when it does that, the ice and the crunching, like, <laughs> does that sound crazy? <laughs> so, like, when it's making the snow cone? Yeah, you know, the machine, and then you hear the ice. I don't know. It just sounds fun. <laughs> Out of all the things in your life, you're going snow cone machine sound. <laughs> Well, the ocean, but everybody says the ocean, right? I was trying to be different. All right. No, it's I fine. I love the ocean. Don't be the different. crashing of the waves. Like when we go by the beach and like have the door open, crashing of the waves. I love that sound. While you're eating a snow cone, I feel like. Listen, I'll tell you, I'll go a step farther. I'll give you something else that probably nobody has ever told you. The sound that I don't like is the sound of a mosquito. The mosquitoes in Louisiana are ginormous. <laughs> you don't want to hear that sound. <laughs> so maybe I should say, hey, they have trouble here, Neil, that are mosquito sprayers. They spray like every week for mosquitoes. They go through the neighborhoods and spray. So that's probably a good sound. <laughs> you run inside. You don't want to be outside when that's they hilarious. spray. Well, guys and gals, kids and campers alike, it is that time where we do say goodbye for this week. Not to worry, not to fret, not to freak out, not to unravel on us. We will be right back here next Wednesday with another exciting show. But before I let you go, before I say goodbye and adieu and sayonara and adios and choose. I think I got some languages in there. I don't know. You can fact check me on that. I want to ask you this question. And I think Esther said it way better than I did. So I'm just going to kind of borrow from her and do me a favor. Look down right now. What's in your hand? Like, what is it? Is it a pen? Is it that towel that you just got done washing and you're, you're now folding and came out of the dryer? Is it a coffee cup? Is it your heart? Maybe you have your heart on your hand right now because you're, you're carrying a lot of burdens. Maybe it's your Bible. Maybe you're listening right now and, and you've just got done your Bible study and, and you went right into us. I don't know. That's a great thing. So thank you if you did that. Well, maybe it's nothing. Maybe you look down and you realize there's no wedding ring anymore, that there used to be one there and now it's gone. Maybe it's your hand is scarred from a from a bad accident that you had when maybe you were at a low moment and you have that scar still. So maybe that's there. But I want to ask you a question. If nothing is in your hand, does that mean you're nothing? If nothing is in your hand right now, does that mean that you're nothing? Because I'm serious right now. I think all of us on some level are something. But it has to start with us first. We have to care about us before we can ever care about anyone else. And right now, if if you're struggling right now and, and you feel like there is nothing and no one and you don't have anyone. I know you don't know me. We've maybe never met face to face, but you have someone. You have me. And I bet you even have my new friend, Esther. So guys, I'm serious. Like if you need help, if you want love, if you need somebody to care for you before you can maybe care, start to care for yourself, will you just reach out right now? OPSpodcast.com is a great way to do that. You can leave a voicemail there. I give you my word on this and, and promise, pinky promise you, as lame as that sounds, that's the sacred promise to me. I will reach out. I will connect with you. And if you need further help that maybe I can never give, because let's face it, I'm a dude and maybe you're a girl. I will send you my, my new friend, Esther. She will come. She will help and she will care and she will walk you through some amazing stuff. I just know she's capable and willing to do that. I just know it. And guys, again, as, as we say goodbye, just for now, I want you to never forget this. Never, ever forget. Remember when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.